It's Tuesday morning here, PFT Live. We await further word regarding the health of Bill's safety, DeMar Hamlin, who collapsed on the field during the first quarter of last night's game between the Buffalo Bills and the Cincinnati Bengals. The absolute latest information we have came from the team in a tweet that was posted at 1.48 a.m. Eastern today. DeMar Hamlin suffered a cardiac arrest following a hit in our game versus the Bengals. His heartbeat was restored on the field, and he was transferred to the University of Cincinnati Medical Center for further testing and treatment. He is currently sedated and listed in critical condition. That was 1.48 a.m. Eastern. If you're listening, if you're watching, you're most likely familiar with what transpired. In a very widely anticipated game, as things were basically just getting going, it appeared to be a routine play, a routine hit. DeMar Hamlin got up, and DeMar Hamlin collapsed on the field. We see the precautions that kick in on a regular basis. The activities that the trainers and the medical staff engage in, mainly as a precaution. We get used to it. At some point, it became obvious that this was more serious than the usual precautions that are implemented and deployed in situations like this. An ambulance was on the field. CPR was performed. Joe Buck of ESPN said for nine minutes. An automatic external defibrillator device was used to restore the heartbeat of DeMar Hamlin. And DeMar Hamlin was taken to the hospital for treatment, for care. And the game eventually was suspended after a period of time where people who are dealing with unprecedented circumstances are trying to figure out the right way to proceed. It was a difficult night for anyone who cares about the sport of football and the men who play it. It was a difficult night for those trying to deliver the news because there really hasn't been much of it. And what we're going to do over the course of the next hour, we're just going to do a one-hour show today. Peter King's going to join me momentarily. Chris Sims will be with us later. We're going to focus on what we know. We pride ourselves on always trying to push things forward. This isn't a time to push anything forward. This is a time to focus on what we know. And if there are developments over the course of the next hour, we will share them with you as soon as they are properly verified. With that, I bring in Peter King, and I say good morning to him. Thank you, Peter, for joining us today as we deal with something that we always recognize. Everybody connected to the game understands there's a risk of a serious health outcome. It happens rarely. The risk is there constantly, and it is extremely sobering on one of those incredibly rare moments when it happens, not at a practice, not away from the probing eyes of the public, but when we all see it collectively, millions of us, a shared experience, we see it in real time, and I think millions today are traumatized and jarred by what happened last night, and we appreciate you joining us today to, to share your thoughts on where we are and what it means to so many people to have witnessed that last night. Well, Mike, let's talk about a couple of things that medically we can now uh, understand happened uh, with now, I guess, 11 hours since this event occurred, 10 plus hours since this event occurred. You know, it is clear now that from the Buffalo Bills statement at 148 this morning, that the heart of DeMar Hamlin stopped on the field, almost certainly caused, according to Mike Ryan, NFL's uh, medical uh, analyst, uh, and a former NFL head trainer, almost certainly caused by the tackle that he made on T. Higgins. Now, that tackle, we would all agree, is a tackle we see 200, 300 times every weekend in the NFL. There was nothing particularly different about the tackle. It just so happened that most likely that he was hit at exactly the right spot to basically cause this cardiac arrest to occur. Now, the thing that, that I think we can't forget about this is that at every NFL game, there are approximately, approximately 29 medical specialists. That goes from team physicians to orthopedists 
to spotters upstairs, uh, to neurologists, and to EMTs, emergency medical technicians. And in addition, at every NFL game, there is an emergency intubation specialist just in case one is needed. I don't know whether one was needed on Monday night in Cincinnati or whatever happened. We just don't know the full extent to exactly what happened. I only mention all of that because this may sound counterintuitive, but if you're ever going to suffer an incident like DeMar Hamlin suffered in that football game, if you do play football, that an NFL game, an NFL field, an NFL stadium is going to be the place where you can get the best possible treatment after something like that happened. In addition, for a level one trauma center to be two miles away from the stadium and for that staff to go on, go in emergency mode uh, at about 1030 on Monday night when, uh, you know, when we got the all clear really, but he probably arrived in the vicinity of about 940 to the medical center. Uh, I think all, I'm just trying to mention the fact that it's very clear that the care and the level of attention that DeMar Hamlin could have gotten was about as good as a human being could get in the situation that he was in. And that was detailed last night, a conference call that was held just after midnight by various league officials, specifically Jeff Miller, the NFL's executive VP of communications, public affairs and policy, Troy Vincent, the NFL executive VP of football operations, Donna Ponte, who was the top league official on the scene at the game, communicating with the officials and the coaching staffs of the two teams as everyone tried to process in the moment in real time how properly to proceed the idea that there's an emergency action plan that is reviewed with every team every week that is reviewed with the coaches 90 minutes before kickoff you're right peter at that level of the sport the attention to detail when it comes to potentially serious health outcomes is as high as it can possibly be and even then it was a critical moment that unfolded. They did what needed to be done, and they transported DeMar Hamlin to the University of Cincinnati Medical Center for the care that he needs. And the uncertainty lingered for hours afterward. It still lingers. We're still in the moment that we don't know that he will be fine. I think what so many of us are waiting for is the indication that the crisis has ended. We hear critical condition. And we wait. We wait to hear that there has been improvement, that there will be improvement, and that DeMar Hamlin will be fine. And that's what everyone is hoping for and everyone praying, is praying for as we, as we just continue to process what happened and as we continue to wait for more information. And the point you made, Peter, is absolutely right. We see tackles like that occur all the time. There was nothing that, that caught anyone's attention. There was nothing that seemed out of the ordinary. There was nothing that seemed problematic, even after it was clear that he was injured. It wasn't until additional video, and we're not going to share any of that. Anyone who's wanted to see it has seen it. It happened in real time. It played out, and again, many were traumatized just by the moment. That's when it first started to trickle in that this was just different than the ordinary injury. And kudos to the folks who had to recognize it, you could see, if you rewatch it, and I rewatched the entire sequence last night, there's a gentleman who is very urgently attending to DeMar Hamlin, who is trying to get the attention of other people. So that, that again, even with all the apparatus there, the right people have to know when to sound the alarm and when to get things moving, and they did as best they could get things uh, mobilized. Hey, Mike, can I tell you DeMar one Hamlin. thing about about that person who apparently, and from the looks on television, uh, looked in particularly urgent mode. Uh, Mike Ryan told me this morning that he, he doesn't know this, but at every 
game, there is also an, in, an internal medicine specialist. And an internal medicine specialist in a case like this might basically be looking for what happened to... Do, do you remember the story, Mike, of DJ Hayden at the University of Houston? where before DJ Hayden came into the NFL, there was a lot of question about should we even draft DJ Hayden because he had a, a very traumatic heart injury while playing football in which his aorta was torn and he walked off the field and seemed absolutely fine. And it wasn't until later uh, on further examination that they found that his aorta was torn, which means that the normal heart function uh, is disrupted. Blood can be spurting into internal areas of the body rather than simply pumping to all areas of the body. And so it's possible that the person who was looking on with such urgency could have been a person who was saying, listen, this may not just be uh, a cardiac uh, cardiac arrest, it could also be something more serious. And that is what my intention was to describe how 29 medical personnel uh, are at every NFL game. And so it, it appeared as though anyway, that even though, uh, you know, Hamlin was in great distress on the field, that almost immediately he was getting about as good a care as a human being could get in that situation. And there's been so much sensitivity, and rightfully so, over the past 13 years to head trauma. There are other ways that you can suffer very serious outcomes playing football. There are other organs that can be compromised, the heart and others. Chris Sims will be joining us in a while. He is the player who lost the spleen as a result of a series of hits that he took on a very hot day in Tampa Bay back in September of 2006. And the doctors had to recognize that he was in a very serious condition. This all happened after the game. It didn't play out on the field during the game. That's what makes this one different. I thought of Corey Stringer, Peter, the yeah. Minnesota Vikings right tackle who died as a result of heat stroke at training camp. Again, that didn't play out for us to see. It was very traumatic to hear about it. It was very concerning. It underscores the risks of participating in activities like that in heat, and changes were made as a result of it. But it wasn't a shared collective experience. We say all the time that the NFL is the one thing that can bring millions together in one moment. Nothing else does that anymore. Nobody watches the same thing at the same time other than professional sports, college sports, specifically NFL football. And to see that happen as a gigantic audience had to be tuned in for a very impactful late season game, it's something that a lot of people are having trouble processing. And we continue to wait for further word on the status of DeMar Hamlin. The NFL's conference call that was held last night included a very clear and plain statement from the league. And this is the absolute right thing to do. It's the only thing to do. There is no consideration of what happens with the remainder of last night's game. That's what Jeff Miller, the executive VP of communications, said. There's nothing in consideration right now. Our concern is for the player and his well-being at the appropriate time. I'm sure we'll have a conversation around the next steps regarding the game. The game does not matter. And that's one thing that I think was very reassuring and comforting to anyone paying attention to it. Immediately, the concern pivoted to the player on behalf of everyone that I saw last night, listened to last night, every message from the league, every indication is, despite the stakes of the game, those stakes are trivial in comparison to making sure that DeMar Hamlin is okay. All the other stuff will figure itself out. There are plenty of smart people who will come up with a fair and acceptable solution to this problem. But, you know, people thought initially, Peter, well, they'll just take up the game tomorrow night or they'll take it up Wednesday. Or just, the, the Bills went back to Buffalo. Some initially were going to stay with DeMar Ham Hamlin by 2 a.m. or so. It was clear that the Bills are returning to Orchard Park, New York. There's not going to be a game anytime soon. The focus for now will be and will continue to be DeMar Hamlin, the rest of the league has stopped. There's nothing else to do for any of us who care about football and care about the men who play the game 
than to wait for further word on the status of DeMar Hamlin. That's what we're committed to doing, and I think that's what the vast majority of football fans and media will be doing in the coming hours, days, however long it takes to find out what the status is of DeMar Hamlin as we all hope and pray for the absolute best for this 24-year-old man. Younger than our children, Peter, and that shouldn't. I mean, I mean, it's just one of those things that for us, you know, we've been covering the game a long time as our children grow up, and I'm sure you went through this too. You start realizing the, the, these people that we cover are younger than our children, and th- that adds another layer to it to anyone out there who has kids, especially if they have children who are older than a 24-year-old young man who is dealing with something that that none of us had on our radar screen going into last night's game. Well, I think one of the powerful things that I started to realize last night uh, when reading a lot about DeMar Hamlin and understanding the goodness of him and uh, the, the love that is in his heart, particularly for his native Pittsburgh, y- you know, you just realize that when you watch the game and anybody goes down, it could be anybody. It could be any one of the players who is dressed for that football game on a given night, a given day. And that's why you saw all the emotion because every one of those players understands that could be him. And Mike, one other thought occurred to me watching this last night. I've been covering the NFL for 39 years And I've never seen the level of concern on players' faces after an injury or an on-field incident that I saw last night. Because usually what happens in the NFL, the NFL has uh, serial next man up syndrome. (laughs) That's how players are basically conditioned to play. You learn it, especially if you're in, say, a big-time college football program, or certainly in the NFL. If an injury happens during training camp, if an injury happens, uh, you know, on the field during the week of practice for an NFL team, what happens is the trainers and the medical people go tend to the player who has a knee or shoulder or some injury that he has, and they tend to him. And all the coach does is simply move the practice a few yards away so that they won't be disrupted by the injured player. I'll never forget at the Super Bowl um, that actually that uh, Chris's dad, Phil, played against uh, his Giants were in the Super Bowl in January of 1991 in Tampa against the Buffalo Bills. And Phil Sims was injured that year and wasn't going to play in the game. Jeff Hostetler played. And I remember going out to dinner that week with with Phil. And he really didn't have all that much to do because Bill Parcells' practice uh, on injured players was that they were not going to be heavily involved in the preparation for the game. So the players could basically be off doing different things. And it just has occurred to me over the years that when you get injured in the NFL, you it's not that you're a non-person. It's just you can't help us, and so we don't really need you right now. So, you know, go over there, and the players who are going to play, we will get prepared with them. And that's why this was so totally different. It was different because you have 89 other players on the field from both teams looking at that and saying, this is not a torn ACL. This is not a cracked rib. This is someone whose life is in danger right now on the field. And so I think that really hit me about the scene last night, that this game was not going to go on. And, and, and they were going to bring this player, DeMar Hamlin, to the hospital. And all of a sudden, it was nothing about DeMar Hamlin, the player. It was all about DeMar Hamlin, the person, saving his life and making sure that he can uh, hopefully recover from this and go on to live a normal life. We have the image of Josh Allen 
the video of Josh Allen's reaction with his hands on his face was the chilling moment for me that this is not the standard precautionary measure that is taken if someone may have suffered a neck injury that we see once every three weeks thereabouts something like that happens and it's stopped and we're, we're being very careful as they should be it that's when it felt different the reactions from the players the reactions from the crowd that's when this is serious something very serious is happening and where does everyone go from here to understand the situation and, and how anyone can possibly move forward. There were some moments of confusion last night that will be sifted out and sorted out at some point in the future. They don't really matter to where things stand now. But last night on the conference call with Troy Vincent, Jeff Miller, and Donna Ponte, the question came up because there were a very limited number of questions that typically and primarily came from Bill's media and Bengal's media. During the broadcast, there was a suggestion at one point that the game would resume after a five-minute opportunity for the players to warm up. Troy Vincent said that he does not know where that came from. It never crossed our minds to talk about warming up to resume to play. There were ongoing and constant discussions between referee Sean Smith, the coaches, as to what to do. Troy Vincent said he was in constant communication with Commissioner Roger Goodell and NFL Players Association Executive Director DeMore Smith about what to do, how to proceed. The concern was DeMar Hamlin. The concern was the players, the coaches, anyone out there who would be called upon to continue the game if that was the decision that was going to be made. And it became obvious through the passage of time. And as we saw more and more about how serious the situation was and how traumatized everyone connected to it was, primarily and specifically the players and the coaches, that it was not the answer to continue. And Peter, that is the 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 push against what you were explaining, how players are injured all the time, the game keeps going. Whether you're injured during practice, whether you're injured during a game, that's the way it's always been. Everyone knows there's a risk of injury that will keep you from continuing in the game, so the game necessarily must continue without the player. And it took time for everyone to realize how serious the situation was and that there really only was one option to suspend the game, postpone the game, and if need be, cancel the game and not finish it. Again, those are decisions, as the league said, will be made at the appropriate time. For now, the only appropriate thing to do is to wait for further word on the status of DeMar Hamlin and hope and pray that he will indeed be fine. You know, Mike, uh, last night, when you're watching all this and when you're sifting through all the information, I noticed a GoFundMe page for DeMar Hamlin. He ran a toy drive uh, in his native McKees Rocks, Pennsylvania for Christmas. And his goal for this toy drive on the GoFundMe page was for $2,500. With that $2,500, he had hoped to buy some toys for underprivileged children where he came from. And I just refreshed the page, and as of this morning, there have been 127,000 donations to the toy drive. And the toy drive now stands at more than $3.2 million. And that isn't just Bills fans or sympathetic Bengals fans. That is from people all over planet Earth. And that is how much this has impacted and affected everyone. And I just kept thinking to myself, think how, when and if uh, DeMar Hamlin, who currently uh, lays apparently sedated in a Cincinnati hospital, think about what will happen when DeMar Hamlin finds that out. And I just kept thinking to myself, imagine how thrilled he will be at this horrendous turn of events that became something uh, incredibly positive at the same time. And obviously that is a byproduct, a sidebar. It's not nearly uh, as important as anything related to DeMar Hamlin's health. But I did think that 
you talked about everyone coming together at a time like this and Bills players, Bengals players coming together at a time like this. And I can think of nothing else that binds people, you know, through the sport of football than an event that everybody can say, we need to show DeMar Hamlin that we really care about him. And I do think his GoFundMe page screams that we care about you, DeMar Hamlin. And, and it's a vehicle for people to do something slash anything to show that they care. The Bills fans started this dynamic several years ago with – showing appreciation, showing respect, showing love and admiration by contributing to the causes important to the players. Remember, it was a playoff win by the Bengals over the Ravens that got the Bills in several years ago. And Andy Dalton, the Bengals quarterback at the time, his foundation was flooded with donations from Bills fans. Within the past two years, when Josh Allen's grandmother died, Bills fans and fans of all teams flooded the hospital in Buffalo, O'Shea Children's Hospital, with millions of dollars in donations. It's a way that that people can show they care at a time of serious need where there's nothing that really can be done. We hear that all the time. We say that all the time. Let me know if there's anything I can do because people want to help even if there is nothing that can be done in situations like this. People find something they can do. And it illustrates how many people care. It illustrates how many people are concerned, are worried, are praying for this young man. And this number is going to keep going up and up and up, Peter. As you said, it's over 3.2 million. It will keep going up and up because this is the one vehicle for people to to continue to show that they care about the men who play the game. And specifically, this young man, Damar Hamlin as he continues to receive care and continues to be in critical condition at the University of Cincinnati Medical Center. Mike, you know, one other thing I just wanted to point out about about the injury itself and about what happened during the game. Um, I think, you know, aside from two or three other, or two or three uh, people whose first thought is, well, what, is going to happen to the game is this going to be is this game going to be restarted on thursday is it just not going to be played is it you know the fact is that you know i think the vast majority of reaction to this is we just don't care figure it out someone will figure it out later in this week maybe today who knows i don't really care uh, well, what does it mean for for home field in the AFC? I, I don't care. You know, the Bills and the Bengals are going to the playoffs. Kansas City's going to the playoffs. Where these games are played, stop. Just, just stop. You know, and if this game doesn't get played, if the NFL just moves on this weekend with the current games and they just declare this game unplayed, no contest, I don't know, whatever word, it's unprecedented. I don't care. And so I think that seeing that the vast majority, the vast majority of reaction to this, both in the media and from the players, was we don't care about this game. We care about DeMar Hamlin. I think that is a very, very healthy response. And think of it, Mike. This arguably was the game of the year in the NFL. And it had started off like firecrackers, you know, with Joe Burrow taking the Bengals down the field uh, and throwing that beautiful first touchdown pass to Tyler Boyd. Uh, and, and, And so, you know, this was going to be a fabulous display of the sport's greatness. Uh, and in an instant that was taken away and I just have no interest in focusing on eventually someone's going to have to focus on what becomes of this Uh, But I'm glad that time wasn't last night or, quite frankly, this morning. Well, Peter, we're going to wrap this up, and thank you very much for your time today. But I want to say one thing, because I thought of you last night 
as, you know, in those helpless moments of just trying to put your brain into some positive use. As you wait, as you're horrified, as you're concerned, as you're worried, and you think, well, they can't play this game. Well, how can they not play this game? How can they have less than a full season for the Bengals and the Bills? I thought of something that you reported during the first year of the pandemic. The NFL was fully prepared to accept the possibility that not every team will play its full slate of games. At the time, it was 16. And if we have to make decisions about playoff seating or home field or whatever based upon winning percentage instead of raw win loss, so be it. So be it. That's what we have to do. Sometimes you just do what you have to do. It may not be perfect, but you just do it. And I think that's where this should be pointing and will be pointing again. It's premature, but it shouldn't freak anyone out. There should be no one out of the 100% of media and fans who are following this. There should be 0.0% who are worried about that aspect of what will we do if they don't play this game. We will move on. That's what we'll do. And, and, and I thought of you in that report because the NFL was ready to accept that two years ago. The NFL should embrace it now is the right thing to do. And I, I, I think they will at the appropriate time. And the appropriate time will arrive at some point sooner rather than later, Peter. And look, I think last night the NFL did the wise thing in basically reiterating that, you know, we're not going to talk about the game now. And, you know, we'll talk about the game at the appropriate time. I'm not sure what an appropriate time is going to be, but it certainly was not um, in three or four hours after uh, a man lay on the field and you weren't sure whether he was going to live or not. Peter, we thank you very much for your time this morning. We know it's a difficult subject, and as always, you handled it with grace and with information that will help everyone better understand the situation. We uh, we wish you a, a great day, and uh, we'll be talking to you soon. We're going to take a break. Chris Sims will join me when this Tuesday edition of PFT Live continues right after this. Some of the tweets that were posted last night in the aftermath of the DeMar Hamlin collapsing onto the field. Nine minutes of CPR, as Joe Buck of ESPN explained. Automatic external defibrillator transported to a level one trauma center, the University of Cincinnati Medical Center. And the latest information, again, from the Bills. This came at 1.48 a.m. Eastern. DeMar Hamlin suffered a cardiac arrest following a hit in our game versus the Bengals. His heartbeat was restored on the field. He was transferred to the UC Medical Center for further testing and treatment. He is currently sedated and listed in critical condition. Chris Sims joins us now. Chris, I mentioned you earlier the health situation, the very serious health situation that you experienced in September of 2006. It didn't happen specifically. It didn't play out specifically during the game, but it was in the immediate aftermath, and you you were in the focus of – all of the medical experts who are there to mobilize to recognize that something serious is wrong with a player and they recognized it with you and and they they saved your life no doubt about it right mike i mean it's it's again i think we saw the tip top you know medical staff the nfl at, at its its finest moment and really one of its worst moments there coming together as a unit and mobilizing and getting together and doing what they had to get, you know, to, to get done for Damar Hamlin and his health sake. And yes, my my case itself, it was urgent for sure, but nothing like this. Yeah, I, you know, I got in the locker room. I laid down on the floor. They, you know, poked and prodded me for a little bit, took me to the emergency room, and then it got serious and, and we had to rush into surgery and all that. But this had a level of... Um, scrutiny and concern that I, I feel like we've never seen in, in the history of the NFL. And I, 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 I mean, we haven't. I heard you and Peter talking earlier. It, it hit me, Mike, in the moment. I mean, of course, it hit me in the moment as a father, as a fan of the game, as an ex-player of the NFL, just trying to put yourself in the shoes of the players on the field at that moment, what they could be going through. And then I think the other thing, Mike, just when it hit home, right, you know, we saw the injury. We saw the concern when they went to commercial break. But you're thinking, okay, well, you know, hey, he hit his head or, you know, oh, they're checking his neck. I hope he's okay. 
but it went to like code red, red alert when we came back from the commercial break. I don't know. That was the moment it hit me, Mike. I know you you talked about when you saw Josh Allen. That was like the chilling moment. That was that was like, oh, wow, this is crazy serious. But when they came back from that commercial break, you saw Sean McDermott like hovering around the huddle talking to himself. And you saw guys already in prayer. And that's when I went whoa, wait, this seems like this is like more than the normal head injury, neck injury type of thing. And that's where, you know, you really started to worry and get concerned. And it's just um, a crazy moment. It really is. It's it's one where it's 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 hard to talk about and and feel almost emotionally exhausted just from the night of thinking it, thinking about it, thinking of DeMar Hamlin, his family and and still thinking about it this morning. It's just um an unbelievable moment in NFL history, and, and my thoughts and prayers go out to him and his family. And think about this, Chris. Think of how it affected yeah. us and so many others who were simply watching it on TV. For those players and coaches and support staff, the people who were on the field and in and around that situation, there's an unprecedented sensitivity to mental health. There will need to be efforts to make sure everyone – who witnessed that, everyone who experienced that is okay. And that's part of this process moving forward for the Buffalo Bills particularly, but also for the Cincinnati Bengals players who witnessed what happened to DeMar Hamlin. They, they are injured too in a very different way, obviously, but there are, there are more people to be concerned about this morning beyond the very serious and real concern we have for DeMar Hamlin as we wait for updates the people who were traumatized firsthand. We all were traumatized if we were watching the game. But think of what those players and coaches are dealing with this morning, today, and what they will deal with going forward, regardless of the outcome for DeMar Hamlin. And again, we hope and pray for the best. This is something that that the players on both teams are going to have to process, and there's no rule book, there's no precedent, there's no guidance other than what the appropriate medical professionals believe that these individuals need to do to, to process and heal the emotional trauma that they've suffered, that none of this, none of us really, again, we know the risks, but they don't play out the way they did last night. We know it's possible, but we never saw anything like we did last night. No, never. And, 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 and then that's where I think, you know, you, you became, you know, pretty apparent within that, you know, that second commercial break and the moment you're talking about with Josh Allen and they start to show players across the field and how they're crying and breaking down and praying and all of these things where that was when you go, I, I, I don't think they can play this football game. It's a game of emotion, and you have to, to a degree, pump yourself up to not like the guy on the other sideline. And I don't, I want to dislike him, and I want to hit him hard and show him that, you know, we're the, we're the macho, tough football team, you know, on the field here today. Uh, there's just such an aspect of that in the NFL, and it became just too much of a real life moment. And players, yeah, they're macho football guys, sure. You know, but again, they are humans. These are guys that have charities, are, you know, great fathers, uh, the leaders of their family who take care of, you know, come from broken homes and have taken care of, you know, brothers and cousins and everybody. So the, the humanity of the moment just became so great that you couldn't expect the players to rev it up and block out all the noise right away. And especially the Buffalo Bills. That's the point to me, Mike, is, you know, along with what you're saying, is just that, hey, Cincinnati, that was tough on them, but the Bills, this is like one of their guys. This is this is a, a brother, you know, and, and that's where it was, I was like, I don't think Josh Allen and Sean McDermott and these guys can emotionally get ready and get invested back into the game. And that's not fair to them. And that's where I was glad that the game stopped and the NFL did, did all the right things really uh, last night. Chris, one of the points I heard repeatedly last night is how closely knit the bills team is because 
they live in a place where there isn't a lot to do. And that's not a judgment. I live in a place where there isn't a lot to do. Some of us prefer it that way. But when you do that, you become closer to the people that you are with. You spend extra time with them. You get to know them better, and it becomes even more of an emotional trauma to witness what occurred last night. There was a point where several of the Bills players were actually going to stay in Cincinnati with DeMar Hamlin. Now, at some point, that became all of the Bills went back to Orchard Park. But it just shows you the the love, the affection, the connection, and the, the damage to the individuals who witnessed it. The primary concern far and away is DeMar Hamlin. But there is a broader issue here that the NFL, the Bills, and the Bengals need to be sensitive to as we move forward. And, you know, the reality is during football season, the train keeps rolling down the track. That's what's so different about this. Peter was mentioning earlier, and we talk about it all the time. And, you know, one of the things we try to do is get people to understand the humanity of the individuals who are wearing the uniforms. It's, it's hard because they look superhuman. They look like superheroes. They look like they can literally fly, Right. They look like they are different from the rest of us. They're constituted differently. They're impervious to the things that affect her. They're not. They're not. They're human beings. Human beings under every helmet. And that's where this, it doesn't work like it normally does. Normally, player gets injured. You know, I say this all the time, Chris. It is a football machine with interchangeable parts. One part is broken. We remove it. We put another one in. And it keeps going. Everybody understands that. Everybody, next man up has become the mantra over the past 20 years. People understand that this is, this is dramatically different, and I think everybody associated with the game recognizes it, and it's something that we all process less than 12 hours from when it happened. It's like time has stood still for the last 12 hours while we primarily wait for a word on the status of DeMar Hamlin. But this is going to be different than anything that any of us who cover the sport, who love the sport, who follow the sport, who work in the sport have ever dealt with. And we just have to let it play out and understand and be sensitive to everyone who was affected by it while we ourselves deal with the effects that we've experienced. Yeah. yeah. Millions have been right. affected by this. A hundred percent. I mean, it, it's one that that's so great. It makes you wonder, wait, can the Bills get it revved back up and really prepare for a Week 18 matchup? That, I mean, it, it's, it's honestly something I thought about here over the last, you know, 12, 14 hours, however long it's been. I guess it hasn't even been 12 year hours yet. So it's shorter than that. But yeah, that's that's an incredible ask. And yes, I know these are professional football players and it's it's big business and you're going out there trying to prove yourself. But Mike, the, you know, hey, there's like, th this, is, this is where, you know, the extension of your family, football is family, right? I mean, we've had jokes about that a little bit in the past and go, no, this is kind of where it's a real moment because again, it, it's for players in a locker room, you're just, you're around these guys, you're around your teammates all the time, this time of the year. It's six days a week. It might be seven days a week, really. And you know personal aspects of all their lives and you know their family and their cousins and whatever else. And to your point, Mike, in a place like Buffalo, as compared to New York, where, hey, we're going to this club or this restaurant and the team can be, you know, a little bit uh, more spread out through an area. Yeah, like I played in a place like that in Tampa Bay, where it was a little more of a, a, a smaller town, a smaller place. When we had a day off, what did we do? Hey, the players called each other and we hung out. Hey, let's play Xbox. Let's go fishing. Let's go to the beach. We were always together. And that is kind of the, the culture they have up there in Buffalo because of the city and because it's a really close-knit team. It's a team we've talked about all year, Mike, that's on a mission. We were talking about it in training camp. You could feel it when you were there, Rodney Harrison and I at training camp, just the, the closeness of the football team and the belief of this football team. And uh, there's just so many aspects and avenues of this that are just uncharted water. And um, I just don't know where it goes. But, yeah, the number one thing is is that these are caring people. And we hear about the bad apples a lot in football. I, I understand that. But, man, for the most part, as you and I both know, a lot of these guys are awesome, awesome human beings. You mentioned that marketing slogan, football is family, and we have expressed cynical views about that in the past, that football is business, and they say football is family because it's good for business to say that. This is a moment where the slogan takes over. 
it proves itself in a way that no one ever anticipated from the millions in donations being made to the GoFundMe page where the goal initially was $2,500 that DeMar Hamlin wanted to raise so some underprivileged children in his community of McKee's Rocks would have Christmas presents. That number, Chris, is going to keep going up and up and up because this speaks to the humanity of the players. It speaks to the humanity of the people who follow the game, who cover the game, who love the game. That's what ties us all together as football fans. And we're seeing that love for the sport and the respect and admiration and love that we all need to have for the men who play it, who put themselves in that position. As vague and small as the risk may be, we're reminded the risk is always there. And for those of us who derive enjoyment, who make a living from the sport, we can never lose sight of that again. And maybe for a lot of people, because it never happened, it didn't seem like a real risk. We now see that it is a real risk. And that's part of what we're trying to process as we move forward. We see the worst fears play out. And that's part of what everyone has to recover from as the sport moves forward. Because we know the sport eventually will. But for now, I think the wise thing that the NFL has done, it's press pause on everything. We press pause on everything. This is all we're going to talk about. We're only doing an hour today. We'll re-air it after that. We're not going to post any content at P. It, it all seems trivial and trite now. It just we'll seems about weird. Anything, right. we'll I about hear anything you. Other than this. There's nothing else to discuss there's nothing else to do other than wait for official word on the status of DeMar Hamlin and also to think about the real impacts on the other players and coaches and make sure they are okay too. Yeah, that that's right. We got to we got to make sure all those t- t's are crossed and the i's are dotted as far as humans here and worry about the guys in the locker room and and again, you know, in, in the NFL locker room too, you know, a lot of guys they're they're from troubled families, broken families. So your teammates and, and, and their families are really, really are a part of your family. I mean, it's, it's who you lean on for advice and telling them problems and troubles. And uh, that's kind of the brotherhood of the NFL to a degree. That's where it's at its greatest. And, and to you, you know, to what you're saying, Mike, you, know, you, you do know what you signed up for when you play football. I knew that. I watched my dad get crushed by Reggie White and people like that for his career, you know, for 15 years and understood, man, this is brutal out here. I get it. But it crosses a line when, you know, for even my own life and, and, and scenario that I went through. When you start to get into the death conversation, that's where it's like, whoa, this is, hey, I knew we could maybe, you know, break a shoulder or break a leg or, you know, I'm going to get my bell rung a few times and, 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 and be rattled as far as concussion or whatever. All those issues. You understand you're going to sign up for that. But, you know, death is not one that you think about as a football player. And as you have said, I mean, we always felt like this day could come. It's, it's thousands and thousands and thousands of players and, you know, hundreds of games every year. Um, but it, it just has a, a different feel when it kind of hits you in the face and you go, whoa, wait, yeah, this is football. This is a brutal sport. But uh, I didn't think we'd be sitting there watching somebody have to have their life saved on the football field in live action last night. Uh, that's that's a whole different category altogether. There was a comment from Ryan Clark last night as he and Scott Van Pelt did a masterful job in the immediate aftermath with so much confusion of trying to understand and help us all realize what was happening and process it. Ryan Clark said, when I was 24 years old, I didn't even think I could die. I mean, that's it. it's one thing to say, I know what I signed up for, but you really don't think you signed up for the possibility that your life would end on the field. Right. And I think that that is the thing that will cause everyone who plays the sport at every level to take a step back and process that. We kind of knew there's a possibility. But now we see a reality of a very, very serious health outcome. And, and that will cause folks regardless of their role in the overall football ecosystem to to take a different look 
at this game. Now that we've seen that thing that we just kind of vaguely were concerned about and were aware of, but okay, yeah, sure, it's out there, but it's never happened, and it's not going to happen at the NFL level. We see stories every year about serious health health outcomes at the lower levels of the sport where there isn't a small army of healthcare professionals there to provide emergency care and do what was done for DeMar Hamlin. And it's not a national shared experience like this one. This is different. This changes the equation for a lot of people connected to the sport, and it just causes them to understand it's not just a theory. It's a reality, and it can be a reality, and it's going to make it different, Chris. Whenever the games are played again, Whoever is involved, it's going to make it different when you watch that game. At least for a while, when a routine hit leads to that outcome, I, 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 I'm going to have a hard time watching a routine hit and a routine game and not be thinking, did something else? I mean, you, you, how, can, how can we not? How can we not? Sure. As we just watch the sport and just the guys who play the sport, you know, is this going to happen to me? And and yes, it's unprecedented, but once it happens, it changes the way you think of it. Yeah, it, it does. You know, it, it brings humanity back into it where it's entertainment and we go, oh, wow, big hit. Now we're going to go, ooh, I hope he's okay. Ooh, man. Not even you big know, hit, have routine that. hit, All any right. hit. That's what I mean. And that's any where hit. I think yeah. this, is, this is crazy too. We're in uncharted waters as far as the category of health and safety here. You know, we've all, hey, head, we're talking about head all year long, concussions. We're making progress. We made progress in football with, you know, keeping the head up, see your, see your target to protect the neck and all those areas. This is one that we don't really think of. What? Getting hit in the heart? That can cause cardiac arrest? So we're down another road here of safety of the game that really I don't think is even registered on an NFL player's like brain or what can go wrong. What? I mean, that's one that I, 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 Hey, I never thought I could lose my spleen playing a football game, let alone wait, I could get hit somewhere in the chest and like what you're talking about and somewhat of a pretty routine hit and, and go into cardiac arrest. That that's, that's where it, it's crazy as well, Mike. We, we got to take a quick break. We'll wrap up this Tuesday edition of PFT live right after this. Football fans throughout the globe showing DeMar Hamlin that they care. A community toy drive with an initial goal of $2,500 is now at $3.325 million and counting, Chris. And that number is going to go up and up and up because this is an opportunity for everyone who cares about DeMar Hamlin and anyone who plays football to show it. Yeah, well, that's is where, you know, the NFL community, the NFL fan base, that community, it, it shows how special it is. And I think it's back to the humanity and forget about the competition and we want hard hitting football. This is about life here and this is a, a positive sign. We appreciate some of your time today. We'll have updates throughout the course of the day at profootballtalk.com. We'll see you tomorrow. See ya. Hi, it's Mike Florio. Thanks for watching PFT on YouTube. Hit subscribe for the latest news and analysis from Pro Football Talk.